Um, concerning living uniquely for the gospel, we need to realize as a snapshot, as a kind of a uh, bird's eye view of what the Lord's ministry today is, okay? This new way, which we are endeavoring to practice in all the churches in the Lord's recovery, involves basically four uh, steps, okay? The first one is to learn how to knock on doors, okay? We don't just mean physically knocking on doors. What we mean by that is to contact people, how to touch people with the high gospel. We are not here preaching, you know, uh, the heaven and the hell kind of a low gospel, right? If you believe in uh, the Lord, you will go to heaven. If you not, if you don't believe, then you will perish in hell, in the lake of fire. That is a very low gospel. And in fact, it is not according to the truth, right? Uh, at least half of that is not true, right? It doesn't mean that if we believe in the Lord Jesus, we will go to heaven. That, that is altogether a uh, e erroneous concept. We need to present people with the high gospel concerning God's economy, right? And then we need to learn how to baptize people not only in water, but also into the triune God. After they are believed, they have believed, we have to set up meetings in their homes, okay? Not in our homes, in their homes. So when we talk about home meetings, we are speaking about meetings in the homes of the new believers, okay? Not in our homes, but in their homes. Of course, we need to have meetings in our homes as well, okay? But, but the home meetings we are speaking about is concerning after a person is saved, then we should learn to meet in their homes, okay? So number two, we need to learn how to feed them, feed them the truths concerning the triune God, concerning life, concerning Christ, concerning the church, okay? And we have to learn how to teach the truth in the homes, in their homes, right? So there's the matter of the feeding, which is the nourishing. And then there's the matter of the teaching, right? To perfect them in the truths. So they need to grow and they also need to be educated. Number three, we need to learn how to help all the new ones to grow in life, right? So their basic need as a newborn, as a new uh, believer is to grow in life. They need the guileless milk of the word. And then number four, we have to learn how to bring them into the full knowledge and practice of the church, the body of Christ. Right, so they need to grow in life and they need to be taught and perfected in the truth, right? They need to come to the full knowledge of the truth, okay? So this is the Lord's ministry concerning the new way, which all of us in the local churches in the Lord's recovery are endeavoring to practice today, right? These four matters, okay. Let's continue. Um, the gospel that we are sharing, that we are preaching is actually a person. We are not speaking about the low gospel. Oh, if you believe in the, into the Lord, you will have peace, you will have joy, you will have rest. All this is true, but it is superficial. It is very traditional. We must preach the high gospel, the kingdom gospel, right? The gospel concerning the person of Christ. Who is Christ? He is the embodiment of the processed triune God, okay? As the processed triune God, he has been consummated to reach us as the spirit, right? Why? Because 
he is for our enjoyment. In order for us to enjoy God, he must become processed in order to become the spirit, right? So that he can impart life into us. This is for the enjoyment of the believers, okay? So according to the truth, the gospel is the entire New Testament, the entire revelation of God's New Testament economy. So we are speaking of this as the gospel, right? It's not just, you know, a very kind of a, um, a low basic kind of traditional gospel. No, our gospel is the entire New Testament. Our gospel is the entire revelation of God's New Testament economy, right? This is the gospel that we preach and we must learn this gospel so that we can present the gospel and present this truth to others. What are we living this earth for, right? What is the purpose? What is our goal? Well, we have to honestly say our goal to live on this earth is the gospel, right? That's why we, the title of lesson two is living uniquely for the gospel. We're not here living for ourselves. We're not here living for our future. We're not here living for our careers. We are here living for the gospel, right? Our gospel is a person, the triune God processed to be the very spirit within us as our salvation, as our life, as our life supply, as our all-inclusive enjoyment, right? Because we are saved, we enjoy and experience Christ as our life, we enjoy and experience Christ as our life supply, therefore we preach him, we speak him, right? So the gospel that we preach is the person of Christ, who is the embodiment of the process triune God, being experienced and enjoyed by us. Right? So our gospel is not a teaching. It is not a doctrine. It is a person, a living person, a real person, whom we experience and enjoy day by day. Right? And this is our goal. Our goal is to share with others this gospel. Okay. Next. The Lord came as the very embodiment of the process triune God in resurrection and told us that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. Right? So he came as the very embodiment of the process triune God. God was embodied in him, right? And he went through the process of incarnation, human living, crucifixion, and resurrection to become the spirit. And as a result, all authority has been given to him in heaven on earth from the Father. Therefore, in Matthew 28, 19, right? We all know this verse, go therefore and disciple all the nations baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Today, we can go, we can go forth, we can go to the nations, we can go to our neighborhood, we can go to our community, we can go to our families, we can go to the schools. Why? Because the Lord is the embodiment of the process triune God, he has been consummated to become the spirit and he has received all authority, right? And he is sending us. We are the ones who have been commissioned, right? This is our commission. In Romans 1, Paul tells us we are debtors to the gospel. We are indebted. We owe something, right? And this is why we must be those who receive a burden from the Lord to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying, right? It's like if you are on a boat and people are in the water, right? They're about to drown. We must 
rescue them, right? We must, we who are on the boat, right? The, the, the boat is the church. All the people are perishing in the worldly waters, okay? It doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't matter, you know, what kind of a job they have or, or the house that they live in. They are all perishing in the worldly water. We who are in the boat, we who are in the church, we need to rescue them, right? Don't just leave them to perish in the, in the worldly water, in the deathly water, right? We must rescue them and we must care for them, okay? This is our commission. Next, we are all members of the living body of Christ, okay? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we are all the members. And therefore, because we are members of the body of Christ, Romans 12 tells us that we all need to function, right? Not only are we members, but we are, we must be the functioning members, okay? You know, uh, sometimes when you take a, 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 a car ride, right, or a, a bus trip somewhere, and if the journey is two or three or five, six hours, right, it can be a very long trip. And then you are stuck in a sitting position for a few hours, okay? I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but it has happened to me many, many times. And that is when I get out of the car, when I get out of the bus, right, so somehow, you know, like my leg is kind of like, frozen you know i i cannot move my leg has that ever happened to you right why why is it that my leg uh, you know has a hard time moving you know it's kind of frozen it's, it's kind of stuck because the leg has not been moving for several hours right so you can imagine if you are a member in the body of Christ, and you have not been functioning for some time, right? Then you will be stuck. You will not be normal. There will be something wrong because all the members of the body of Christ must function. The body of Christ is living because Christ is living, okay? So the first item of functioning of the members of the body is to preach the gospel. This is our first function, the most basic and primary function. That means we must contact the sinners, reach the sinners. We must knock on their doors to visit them, to bring them, to bring Christ to them, and to bring them to Christ. This is called begetting, right? The B and PB of the God ordained way. The first step is begetting. We must beget them. As believers, sorry, as believers uh, in Christ and members of the body, it is possible for us to be idle, unfruitful, and barren. This is according to 2 Peter 1. Okay, just like the example I gave of the car trip or the bus trip, right? Our leg or part of our body could become idle, could become unfruitful, and then barren, okay? So this is why the verse I read this morning in John 15, if we do not bear fruit, right? We should not uh, kid ourselves. We should not think, oh, I'm still abiding in the vine. No, you are not abiding in the vine. If you are abiding in the vine, uh, genuinely, then for sure you will be bearing fruit, okay? Because if you abide in the vine, it will be very spontaneous to be a fruitful branch, right? But because of our lack of functioning, that is, we do not preach the gospel, we don't care for the sinners, we don't care for the dying, right? We don't care for those who are perishing. Therefore, we become idle, we become unfruitful and we become barren, okay? Now, uh, 
the excerpt that you will read later refers to Matthew 25. Recently, I have been going through this chapter, especially the parable for faithfulness, right? Concerning the talents, the five talented ones, the two talented ones, and the one talent members, the slaves. You all know the story, right? This is a very sobering, sobering parable, okay? According to Matthew 25, suppose, okay, tomorrow morning, Tuesday morning, the Lord comes back. According to this parable in Matthew 25, we all have to give him an account of what we have been doing after we have been saved. Okay. According to the Bible, Matthew 25, each one of us, there's no escape. You cannot say this, you cannot say that, you cannot give any excuses. We all have to appear before the Lord individually. It is not church by church. It is not family by family. Okay. What, what will we tell him? Will you tell him that you have had a good church life in your locality? And that whatever he has given you is still here, right? Just like the one talented member, he was given one talent, okay? But what did he do? He was afraid and he went off and hid his talent in the earth, right? So at least he kept his talent. He didn't lose it, okay? Is that what we are gonna to say to the Lord? Will we tell him the Lord, you are a hard man, right? Reaping where you did not sow, <laughs> gathering where you did not scatter, you where you did not winnow, right? What would the Lord say to us? Would the Lord say, well done, good and faithful slave, enter into the joy of your master. He said this to the five talented slave and the two talented slave. But he did not say this to the one talent slave. Okay. Instead, Matthew 25, verse 26. Okay. The Lord said, evil and slothful slave. You knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not winnow. Okay. The Lord called him evil and slothful slave, right? This is, uh, this is in reference to our functioning in the body of Christ. There are many functions. The first item of our functioning is preaching the gospel, okay? Now, let me continue with this account uh, in Matthew 25. In verse 26, okay? He called this one talent uh, slave or member evil and slothful. Okay. Remember, this is a saved person. He's not an unbeliever. He is a believer. Right. Do you want to be called evil by the Lord? Do you want to be called slothful by the Lord? Right. I surely don't want to be called that. According to Matthew 25, where will he put you, right? Where will he put you? That is the question we need to ask. Okay. <clears throat> Do not forget that the one who is cast out into the outer darkness is the one who has received the real gift. He has one talent, right? He is not only saved, but also gifted. This is why both in Matthew 25, in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, all these chapters tell us clearly, not only are we saved, not only are we the believers, but
through the Lord. Okay, in hymn 930, and I hope that we will get a chance to sing this, uh, if not in this uh, session, in tomorrow's session, it's an excellent hymn, right? Both uh, hymn 921 that we sang by Fanny Crosby and also uh, hymn 930 is also very, very good. Every time I sing these kind of hymns, right? The Lord stirs up within me a genuine care and burden for people. Hymn 930, the chorus says, must I go and empty handed? Must I meet my savior so? Not one soul with which to greet him. Must I empty handed go? Okay. It's not a, it's not a hymn with high truth, right? But it is a very inspirational hymn. Let me just give you a, a very short background uh, of this hymn. Some of you may know this already. Um, about a hundred years ago, there was a sister in the US who was saved and uh, she had a kind of a very uh, ordinary Christian life. And one day she was on her deathbed. She was about to die and she knew that she was gonna die. And then she felt very, very sorrowful she felt very shameful because the whole life, her, her whole Christian life, she did not even lead one person to the Lord. That means she did not preach the gospel in her lifetime, right? So she was very sad, very sorrowful. When her pastor came, uh, she told her pastor, right, of her situation. And her pastor didn't really know how to comfort her and eventually took her testimony and told her, well, you, you did not bring a single person to the Lord in your lifetime, but maybe your story your testimony will inspire some to preach the gospel, to bring some to the Lord. Okay. And uh, the pastor, his name was Charles Luther, who was the person who wrote him 930. Right. So this is a very, very touching, very inspiring uh, hymn. Many times when we sing this hymn, Tears just come, right? You have to face the fact. Are you willing to meet the Lord and be empty handed? Okay, that means you bring no one to the Lord. That means your whole life, you did not rescue the perishing. You did not care for the dying, right? You did not care for your family. You did not care for your relatives. You didn't care for your friends. You didn't care for your former classmates. You didn't care for any of the people that you knew, right? And of course you don't care for the people that you don't know, right? Brothers and sisters, what should be our attitude? Okay, so the question is, where will we be? There are only two choices, according to Matthew 25, either in the joy of our master or in the outer darkness. Okay. If you read Matthew 25, this is a very solemn and sobering word. Okay. All right. Let me continue. Uh, again, using the same uh, parable in Matthew 25. Okay. He not only gave us the capital, the talent, right? Because we all have received the gift, but he also gave us all authority in heaven and on earth, okay? Why? Because when we go, it is not we ourselves going, 
when we go to knock on doors, it is the Lord also going in our going. When we knock, he is knocking. When we go, he is going. When we speak, he is speaking. When we preach, he is preaching. Okay? So we have no excuse. We have to go to produce interest, to bring forth fruit, right? We must bring some to the Lord. Don't meet the Lord empty-handed. He, he has given us his spirit, his life, himself as our talent, and his authority in heaven and on earth as our portion. Okay? We are more than capable, more than able, to get the interest because the entire world is open to us, right? We have to believe out of more than 7 billion people, there are many, many sons of peace prepared by the Lord waiting for us. This is why in John, uh, John's gospel, chapter four, right? The Lord said the fields are white. Remember that? The fields are white, ready for harvest. But where are those laborers, right? Where are those who can go and reap the harvest? The Lord is asking, who will go? Who will rescue the perishing? Who will care for the dying? Okay? We must go and disciple all the nations to baptize them into the triune God, and teach them what he has taught us. This is our unique commission. Matthew 28, 19. We need to go therefore and disciple all, all the nations. Okay. Then he promised us that he would be with us to the consummation of this age. Right? He is with us. He is Emmanuel. He promised he will be with us every day until the end of this church age, right? Until the end of this age of mystery. Well, eventually at the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter five, we will all have to give him an account according to Matthew 25, okay? So brothers and sisters, each one of us needs to wake up. We must be serious. We must mean business with the Lord. We must live uniquely for the gospel, right? Don't just uh, treat it lightly. Don't say, oh, you know, we're here for the, you know, to be constituted with the truth. You know, I rather spend the time in the word, in the ministry, you know, let others go out. No, we need to be equipped and constituted with the truth, but we also, need to go out, right? We must be those who have a burden for people. Remember, they are perishing. They are dying, okay? Just look at the picture. We are all on a boat, right? And all the unbelievers who are among your family members, your relatives, are all in the water they have been swimming in the water for a long time. And many are weak, right? Outwardly, they have everything, but inwardly, they have nothing. They are weak, they are perishing, and they are dying. If we don't rescue them, if we don't care for them, who will, right? Do you want to be uh, such a person being accused Right? Suppose your cousin, who is an unbeliever, and you do not preach the gospel to him or her, eventually when he or she appears at the great white throne, right? he or she will say, God, yes, my cousin was a believer, was a Christian, but he or she never preached the gospel to me. Right? Would you want to face such a situation? right? Maybe your best friend or your former classmate or your neighbor or your colleague, right? Previously, before you attended the full-time training, maybe you were working, right? These people, they will accuse you. 
they will say, hey, you know, I was with that person for so many years, but they not, never preached the gospel to me even once. Okay. So brothers and sisters, we all need to wake up. We all need to be serious, mean business with the Lord to live uniquely for the gospel. Now, let me continue. In John chapter 15, verse 16, you all know this verse. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I set you that you should go forth and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Okay? We did not choose to go out. The Lord chose us. And the Lord has set us, okay? Look at the word set is underlined. The Lord has set us that we should go forth and bear fruit, right? That means we need to go out. Go forth means to leave from your home, right? To leave from the hall, the meeting hall. Go forth means to knock on doors, either warm doors or cold doors. We have no choice in the matter of being a branch of Christ, the vine, because he caught us. He chose us, right? Because we are all a branch in the vine, we must bear fruit. You go to the vineyard, right? You know that uh, during the harvest season, clusters of grapes must appear, right? <laughs> If you go to a vineyard, right, wherever, and uh, you, you know, after rows and rows and rows and rows of the vine and the branches with no grapes, then what would the farmer do, right? The farmer would not say, oh, well, it's okay, you know, well, you know, uh, uh, it's too bad. No, no. The farmer will try to find out what is wrong, right? So therefore, we as the branches abiding in the vine, we have been chosen by the Lord, okay? The Lord has set us, the Lord has appointed us, not, not just to abide in the vine, but to bear fruit, right? To abide in the vine, the issue, the goal is to bear fruit, okay? Just like the grapevine, you know, the farmer is not going to have the vine there without producing the grapes, he, to bear fruit, is the Lord's setting, the Lord's assignment. He did not assign us to do anything else. He has set us to bear fruit. The Lord charged us to go forth and bear fruit. You read John 15, 16, right? There's only one interpretation. We are not only living branches, but also movable branches. That means we need to go forth right? Don't always stay at home. Don't always stay at the meeting hall, right? We must be those who go out to contact people. We have to go to reach people. And in Luke 10, the Lord told us that we are like the lambs being sent out in the midst of wolves. And yet among the wolves, there are some sons of peace, okay? Maybe not every time that you go, but if you go sufficiently, right, the Lord will give you some sons of peace, okay? It's just a matter of our faithfulness and our labor, right? We trust in the Lord. We don't trust in what we can do. We trust in what the Lord is doing in us, okay? Because he has saved us, he has made us members of his body, and he wants us members of the body to be functioning. And the first uh, function should be preaching the gospel, right? This is something that all the believers must do. Suppose you were saved yesterday, right? If you were only saved yesterday, so you have been a Christian for only one day, you are qualified to preach the gospel. As long as you are a believer, you can preach. Look at the example of the Samaritan woman in John 4, 
right? After she was saved, she left her water pots and went into the village to speak, <laughs> come and see, right? She went and testified of this living Jesus, okay? So it is our responsibility. We are debtors to the gospel. We are responsible to all the people that we know, right? None of us can say, I don't know anyone, okay? We are not an island. We all have connections, either family, that means by blood, or friends, or classmates or colleagues or neighbors, right? These are the people. We must ask how many of them are believers, right? If they are unbelievers, do you not have any feelings for them? Do you realize that they are perishing in the, in the deathly worldly waters? Do you realize they are dying, right? But many times we are indifferent, you know, we have no feelings, right? Oh, well, you know, if they don't receive the, if they don't hear the gospel, well, it's, it's too bad, you know, tough luck, you know, no, we shouldn't do this. Okay. Let me go on. The picture that the Lord has shown us concerning the church life is not to ask people to come to attend our meetings, right? I don't think there is any verse uh, reference in the Bible that asks people to come in that kind of way. But the picture as revealed in the Bible is that we all have to go. We must go forth and bear fruit. This is John 15. After we bring people to the Lord through baptism, we immediately should set up a meeting in their home so that we continue to go to their home, okay? Remember the home is not your home, but the home of the new one, of the new believer. The first time we go to preach the gospel, to baptize them, and then subsequent times we go to feed them, we go to nourish them, right? We go to teach them, we go to perfect them, okay? So this is why after we preach the gospel, don't leave them, right? We made this mistake in the past, right? We went to baptize, uh, uh, to preach the gospel and baptize many, 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 but we didn't really care for their going on. We didn't really pay attention to the matter of feeding, to the matter of nourishing, to the matter of teaching, to the matter of perfecting, and eventually many of these new ones die, spiritually speaking, right? So this is why begetting is only the first step in the God-ordained way, right? But nonetheless, it is a very important step, okay? Because without begetting, don't talk about the other steps. Don't talk about nourishing, perfecting, building up, right? We must begin with beginning. We must begin with gospel preaching, okay? So we visit them in their home, and then we will continue to visit them in their homes to be a sheltering, feeding, teaching, and nourishing. By our going again and again to these new ones, they will grow and be perfected. Our success in the new way depends upon our practice and labor. Are we willing to practice? Are we willing to labor, right? Because the success will only come through that, okay? Don't expect that you just go out once and then you will gain something, right? The Lord will bless us in our going and discipling to carry out his eternal economy so that he may prepare his bride for his second coming, right? For the Lord to come back, two things must happen, right? The body of Christ needs to be built up and the bride of Christ must be prepared, okay? So in order to do this, 
there needs to be many more who will be gained by the Lord. The church must increase and spread. But how will this be carried out if no one goes and preach the gospel? If no one goes forth, right? How could there be the, the remaining fruit, right? So this is why we must be those who uh, pray to be one with the Lord, to take the Lord's heart for people, to rescue the perishing, to care for the dying. And then as we preach the gospel to present the truth, Jesus is merciful and Jesus will save. Okay? All right. Now, I purposely tried to end uh, this lesson. Uh